We've had a lot of what I think are highlights in, the, uh, in this meeting, and I think we're uh, about to see another one. Uh, Vince Smith, who's now with the Illinois Natural History Survey, has agreed to kind of coordinate and put together this uh, uh, genetic barcoding uh, debate. And it uh, should be a lot of uh, fun as well as uh, very instructive about how we should go which way we might want to go with regard to uh, a very controversial issue in this time. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Vince Smith, uh, who will take over and run this uh, debate. Vince? Okay, thanks very much, Mike. Well, once again, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Good morning and welcome to this special session on DNA barcoding. We, we taxonomists, we have a reputation for being rather conservative when it comes to new ideas. And to be fair, that conservatism is probably with good reason. After all, we, we, taxonomy forms the foundation stone of much of modern biology and, and we bear a heavy responsibility to get that foundation right. So when a new idea comes along, something that seems very strange and very different, it's not surprising when maybe naturally very skeptical. That new idea that I'm referring to is of course DNA barcoding, the subject of this date, debate today. But the basic premise behind DNA barcoding is about as simple as it is ambitious. By exploiting the unique variability of small fragments of DNA, advocates of DNA barcoding propose that we can use this variability not only to potentially identify all species on the planet, but also to discover new species. Now on the face of it, DNA barcoding would seem to be a panacea to the problems of taxonomists. It could speed up routine identifications, revitalize the role of our neglected biological collections, and free taxonomists up to get on with that task of documenting and describing the world's biodiversity. But to its critics, well, DNA barcoding is maybe nothing short of heresy. It would destroy a traditional legacy of traditional systematics, reduce taxonomy to some kind of service industry for other biologists, and leave us with a pseudo-taxonomy that's some shabby relic of its former self. Now, I've no doubt some of you might take objection to the way that I've characterized those arguments, but to be fair, they're not my characterizations. These are just a handful of the arguments that have been proposed in a flurry of recent publications on this subject, the most recent of which was featured on the New Scientist magazine. Probably a, a more influential series of articles appeared back in February 2003 in the leading systematics review journal, Trends in Ecology and Evolution. And these five papers basically outlined the case for and against barcoding. And I recently had the opportunity to speak to the new editor of Tree, and she told me that of these five papers, three of them are the most downloaded papers the journal has ever published. And remember, that's the leading systematics review journal. And for your curiosity, there are those papers. In fact, that's their ranking within that top five. So it's pretty clear there's an inherent interest in this subject. Well, today, we've got the opportunity to explore some of these issues with one of the leading advocates of DNA barcoding, Paul Hebert from the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada, and one of its leading opponents, Kip Will, from the University of California, Berkeley. And together, they form our panel with which we can put some of our concerns to. But before we do that, I want to get your opinion. What do you think about DNA barcoding? To do this, we're going to put to you a couple of propositions which our panel have sort of agreed beforehand. Don't get too hung up on these, but basically these outline what I would consider to be maybe two of the three or four fundamental areas concerning DNA barcoding. And we're going to have a vote on these propositions, and we're going to do this now, and we're going to do it at the end of the debate as well, and we're going to get an idea as to see whether their arguments, Paul and Kip's arguments, are able to change anybody's minds. 
Okay, so what are the propositions? Well, the first of these really concerns, I guess, the important one in a sense. Who's going to pay for it? Should we even pay for it? Should we devote resources towards sequencing a reference collection of specimens for the development of a DNA barcoding system? Now, I appreciate some of you might not feel comfortable about voting on something that you don't necessarily feel you know enough about yet. You haven't heard the arguments. So, of course, you'll get the opportunity to abstain. The second of these propositions covers this notion of this role of DNA barcoding in discovery of new species. Should DNA sequences play a primary role in the discovery of new species? And again, yes, no, or abstain. Now, we, have, uh, we, have, we haven't got any sophisticated voting system, I'm afraid, but we do have a team of student helpers who are going to be assisting us. In fact, they're going to be helping us throughout the course of this debate with a few of the things that we've got planned. So if our student helpers could get into position to count, and if you give me the nod when you're, you feel you've done, okay? So the first proposition, let's have the first vote. Should we devote resources towards sequencing a reference collection of specimens for the development of a DNA barcoding system? So all those in favor of that preposition. A flurry of hands. One, two, a few. Okay? Yep. And all those against. And remember, our students can vote as well in this. <laughs> Assuming you're saying United States resources. Yes, yes. <laughs> Should we just end it there? <laughs> I mean, if the Canadians want to finally do something that's fine. No, the, you, you can read into these propositions whatever you like. Okay, and abstentions. Okay, quite a few. Great. And now this final notion about DNA barcoding and its utility in discovery of new species. Should DNA sequences play a primary role, primary role, in the discovery of new species? Yes. Who would vote yes to that? A few hands. And against? A few more hands. Okay. And, oh, hang on, just at the back, the back four rows. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. And abstentions. Okay, thanks very much for that. Well, we'll get the final figures right at the end when we do our second vote. So I think at this stage, you've heard quite enough from me. Let's hear from our first speaker. What I've asked our speakers to do is prepare a short 15-minute presentation, basically outlining what DNA barcoding means to them and why we should be supporting it or we should be against it. There's, unfortunately, there's not really enough time for questions immediately after these. So if you could save your questions to the debate, and at that point, we'll have plenty of opportunity for everyone in the audience to chip in. So if I could introduce Paul. You want to? Sure. Paul is uh, arguably the, uh, perhaps the public face of DNA barcoding. He's a founding member of the Barcoding Life Initiative and has published numerous papers on this subject, the most recent of which is coming out in Public Library of Science uh, just in a couple of weeks' time, I think. So are you, are you this one? Ready to go. Yep. That one there? Yep. Am I going to get a microphone? Uh, I yours? think. Or am I going to be are okay? You, are you okay there or do you want to? I think to I'm okay there. That's okay. great. Thanks very much. Okay. Well, thanks very much to head south uh, and talk to you about DNA barcoding and the opportunity that it may provide to revitalize systematics in Canada and maybe beyond. Um, why do we need it? Well, we need it because of the immense diversity of eukaryotic life alone. There's somewhere between 10 and 100 million species at best guess. Uh, how many can a skilled taxonomist deal with? Perhaps 1,000 uh, in a critical sense uh, to 
deal with that chasm between diversity and the capabilities of the human CPU, we've had to engage in creating keys, and many of them are very effective, but they've got a, a, a long learning curve. The um, contribution that DNA could make in, in bridging this gap is really the creation of a global identification system that's based on a lingua franca, a common key range of key characteristics, if you will. So a DNA barcode is just a short DNA sequence from a standard part of the genome that's useful in the discrimination of species in a particular compartment of life. And DNA barcodes rise out of thinking about how we might use DNA for biodiversity analysis. There are a couple of edicts that we really need to keep in mind if we're going to build an effective system. We need to standardize uh, efforts on a particular gene region, and we need to try and minimize the amount of DNA that we need to look at. That's going to create the most cost-efficient system. If you take a look at things, it appears, at least in the animal kingdom, that it's going to be possible to create a very effective identification system based on a single read. Uh, in the case of fungi and protists, there's growing evidence that it may also be a possibility uh, in the case of some of the other uh, kingdoms of life. It's not going to be a possibility. The identification systems may have to be based on uh, several genes. But the principles of parsimony and standardization are the underpinnings of creating effective DNA identification systems. So I'm now going to talk about the animal kingdom and uh, the work that we've been doing and others have been doing on the use of the cytochrome oxidase 1 gene as a basis for an identification system. Now we've got quite a lot of baseline information on CO1. It's the most heavily populated uh, gene in GenBank with records for more than 6,000 different species at this point in time. Why would we want to focus on this gene? Well, the mitochondrial gene, of course, has 13 protein coding genes, but there are only two of these that are found in all eukaryotes, CO1 and Site B. We've chosen CO1 because we're aiming to create a system with very high generalization, potentially across other kingdoms of life aside from animals. Why the mitochondrial genome? Because it evolves much faster than the nuclear genome, as you're aware, so that it's possible then to look at small amounts of DNA sequence and yet get high resolution. We're just looking at the front 650 base pairs or so of this gene, not the whole gene. It's about 1,500 base pairs long. Again, the principle is minimization. Take things down to the absolute minimum amount of information, make it as cheap as possible. These are the records from GenBank, and they show something quite important. They show, for example, that 98% of the species that have been looked at, and these are closely related species pairs, congeneric species show more than 2% sequence divergence. There are a few young species that don't meet that criterion. The vast majority of species in GenBank show deep sequence divergences, 11.2% on average. This is important because within species variation is typically less than 1%. There are a few groups, benthic cnidarians, that show really slow evolution and it's not going to be possible to use this gene region. All cnidarians, no. Just benthic cnidarians, the planktonic ones are evolving at high rates. It's based on analysis of about 13,000 congeneric cares. And some people have criticized uh, these results on the grounds that GenBank data may be biased. So over the last year and a half, we've engaged in survey sensitivity analysis on the large phyla, on the arthropods, chordates, mollusks. And by sensitivity analysis, I mean taking a look at parameter variation that might be expected to influence the efficiency of a DNA identification system. So we're looking at shifts in rates of evolution. We're looking at shifts in the GC composition of the mitochondrial genome and asking, does this cause the effectives in this system to collapse? So here's the sort of variation I'm talking about. Uh, there's order of magnitude variation in the insects. In different insect orders, the mayflies have some of the slowest rates of mitochondrial evolution. I'm an for the highest order of magnitude difference. GC composition is always very biased in insects. I'm an to have the lowest GC content, mayflies higher. But they're all lower than the vertebrates. And amongst the vertebrates, we don't have such large shifts in rates of evolution. But the birds are probably down at the low end. So I'm going to talk to you about birds and bees as two examples of extremes. The birds, low rate of evolution, high GC. A hymenoptera, high rates of evolution, and low GC content. And here's a little study that we did in Nova Scotia, one of Canada's provinces. There are just 30 species here, but there are a couple of key things that I'll point out to you quickly. 
One is that members of a genus typically hang together. That's not the business of barcoding, really, but it's a fact of the data when you take a look at them. The key parts of the barcode result are as follows. If you look here, you can see the genus Osmia. You can see these deep branches that separate the species in the genus Osmia. The same is true in Megachyla. Same is true as in Andrina. Congeneric species show deep divergences. These are different individuals collected from several hundred kilometers apart in Nova Scotia. They share virtually identical sequences. So within species variation is low, between species variation in congeneric species is large. It's, uh, in the case of bees of Nova Scotia, it's very easy to diagnose the bee species that are found there based on a CO1 barcode. High rates of evolution, low GC content don't impede species recognition. If we look now at the birds, we're working on the birds of North America. We've looked at 400 of the 700 breeding bird species in North America. And here are the results for just one of the families, the sandpipers, that are sort of difficult to tell apart morphologically. There are 30 species shown here. And you can see that even in a genus like Calidris, which is pretty difficult uh, to tell apart morphologically, you can see these deep branches separating these species. You can see that we've analyzed a few individuals of most of these species. These different replicas are on average collected at sites 1,100 kilometers apart. So this is now taking things on a local scale into a continental scale. Very little variation across the continent with one exception, the solitary sandpiper, Tringa solitaria, falls into two groups. It's almost sure that this single species is in fact uh, two reproductively isolated units. If you take a look at this busy slide, it's got uh, data for 260 species now, and there's uh, multiple individuals analyzed for 130 of these species, and the multiple individuals are shown in blue, and you can see that in almost all cases, within species variation is low. Here's a deep uh, divergence. That's the solitary sandpiper you just looked at. This study discovered three more of these cases, uh, the warbling vireo, the marsh wren, and the eastern meadowlark split into two groups. So four overlooked species in the North American bird fauna in this little survey of 130 species. The results on these two species groups, bees and birds, are exactly those that we've now seen in much larger analyses. We've now looked at something like 1,700 different species. So turn in moths from the tropics, the within species variation a quarter of a percent to between 9.52. You can see the common pattern here. Within species variation consistently less than a half a percent or 0.6 of a percent between species, and this is congeneric species, typically more than an order of magnitude, the ratio of inter to intra, ranging from a low of about 17 to highs of values like 166. It's very easy to diagnose species when you've got this gross difference between <laughs> congeneric taxa and members of a species. The, the exercise that we're engaged in is the barcoding of 10 million animal species on this planet. The pilot studies that we've done so far show that this approach is effective in regions varying from the high Arctic to the tropics. We've looked at varied taxonomic groups. The sole place that we've seen problems is in some bent thick cnidarians. The resolution of the system is in far in excess of 99.99%. Let me just show you what I mean by that. This is a matrix. It's a 100 by 100 cell matrix. There are 10,000 data pits on that particular page. Imagine each of those as a receptacle for barcode data on a species. The barcode library of animal life will be composed of 1,000 of these pages. That's 10 million species. The birds of the world will occupy one page. There are about 10,000 bird species. The fishes will occupy perhaps three pages. There are about 30,000 species. If someone gives you a piece of tissue which derived from uh, an uncertain bird, an uncertain animal, let's take the example of an uncertain bird. You barcode it. The barcode data will take you to the bird page. In 96% of cases, it won't just take you to the bird page. It will take you to the bird species. In the cases where it doesn't take you to the bird species, it will take you to the neighboring two or three species, mallard or black duck. That's, it's not perfect resolution, but going from 10 million unknown animal species down to the nearest two 
is incredibly high resolution. So that's why DNA barcoding is going to be an immensely effective tool for identification. But it's not just an identification tool. It's a tool for the discovery of species. It's a tool for the discovery of species because of this gross difference between the amount of variation within species and that between species. Here you can see a figure that shows 27 species, members of a moss species, two different families, Nodontidae and Sphingidae from a site in Ontario. And you can see marked in orange the 1% divergence value in each species. And you can see that the 1% figure captures all the intraspecific variation very easily. Intraspecific variation is low. Note that these bars put together equal 2%. If we were to slice this genetic distance, this tree at a 2% divergence value, we will distinguish every one of the species that's been recognized in Ontario, not Adontis and Sphingers. And of course, we're doing this on a much larger scale, and we're doing it in tropical regions with hundreds of species, and it's the same result. Another little example of bees in Nova Scotia. We analyzed the 13 bombus species in Nova Scotia, and all of the bees in Nova Scotia, actually, and then I did a little collection in my backyard in Guelph, which is 1,200 and some kilometers away. The 13 species from Nova Scotia are in green. Four of the uh, individuals collected from Ontario group closely with species from Nova Scotia, bombus, and patients, and uh, bombus, vegans. There were four individuals. The other three came out as genetically very divergent. And in fact, Lawrence Packer is giving me the species names. They're species that aren't present in, in New Brunswick. This is what a local lab could do, but we're moving, if we're really going to uh, achieve this goal of total coverage for all the animal species on the planet is going to require organization. And the Consortium for the Barcode of Life was established four months ago. 40 biodiversity organizations, major museums, genomics facilities, databasing facilities have indicated that their plans, or they've already joined the consortium as founding members. The consortium aims to set up national networks uh, that will barcode life on national scales. I think Canada is going to have the first of these networks and the Canadian government has provided us with a resource to barcode one-tenth of the animal species in Canada over the next five years, 10,000 animal species. Uh, this will involve collaborative exercises, obviously, with the museums, and in many cases, they may be the, the lead features on the national barcode notes. Analysis means going from the specimens down to the sequencing into a central database. We had a meeting last week with NCBI, and they have indicated their high interest in supporting the development of a barcode database that will meet museum level standards, that will address one of the great deficits in GenBank data. No vouchers, linked, no ability to repeat sequence information. All barcode data is linked to a voucher. This information will be publicly accessible. GBIF has indicated their support. We need central data management. NCBI will do part of that, but the CBOLD is creating the tools to manage data. So the exercise is to produce specimen files for 50 million specimens five per species. Some of you may have visited this website. It's got management tools for barcoding data. Uh, the important thing about it is that every voucher is linked into a specimen page that shows the museum that's holding it, the individual that identified it, an image of the specimen, uh, satellite representation, sca zoomable satellite imagery of where it's found. Hooked to that is a sequence page with the electropherogram so the data quality can be tested. And there are lots of, so that's the data management, that's the basic data unit. There's a lot of project management tools, there's a lot of analysis tools there. Ultimately, this barcode of life database will be used for identifications. Specimens will be sequenced, they'll be compared with the barcode of life database. If you get a high similarity, we'll get a species diagnosis, you'll link to the species page. The sequence is a portal to all the work that people in this room and the has been done over the last 250 years. Similarity of uh, specimens less than that, we get an uncertain identification. It's please explore the taxonomy of this group. This is an example of an identification page where you get a certain identification because there's a matching sequence in the barcode of life database. This is a case where you don't get an identification because it isn't there. There are only 6,000 species in barcode of life today. It's not going to give you an identification in most cases. If folks like you and the collective community of people with interest in biodiversity join forces, this instrument will be built and built quickly. We are aiming that within 10 years there will be devices like this. This will be the field guide that will be used. Uh, devices that integrate PCR, 
sequencing, and finally comparison of that sequence to the barcode of life database. We believe these will deliver identifications in minutes for pennies and that they will be in the first instant covering the animal kingdom, but in the longer term, and people are working now on plants, fungi, protists, life at large. Imagine a tool like this and the way in which it can aid the discovery of life on this planet. And I thank uh, a bunch of colleagues in museums, ecologists, taxonomists, folks in my lab, and the people that have funded this work, uh, particularly the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, they're doing a lot right now, and um, also the Sloan Foundation for their support. So that's my Okay, point. thanks very much. Okay, I know you've got questions, as I say, if we can hold them off for the debate. I'll introduce our next speaker, Kip Will. Um, he's outlined the case against, he's going to outline the case against barcoding. And Kip has argued in a number of publications and in some uh, very powerful presentations, I think he gave a presentation at the Entomology, Entomology Congress in Australia against barcoding. He's argued that barcoding fails in many of its stated goals. So, over to you, Kip. He needs to use the microphone. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's no problem. Actually, I didn't talk about it at the uh, International Congress. Maybe, oh, you didn't. Maybe sorry. After a oh, few maybe years, I, I don't know. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> are you gonna? Are you okay with that mic? Or are you not? Gonna? Not a problem. Right. It's not a problem. DNA barcoding is the anti peat <laughs> the extreme form that has frequently been espoused by its proponents, at least when they think that real systematists aren't listening. Is, an envision, is a vision of replacing the messy science of systematics with something that's objective, easy, quick, something non-scientific. The barcoding hardline is basically a slap in the face of quality programs like PEAT, and it diverts our focus and energy away from the important aspects of systematics and our real objectives. But I'm confident that the students and the primary investigators of the PEAT program won't be swayed by simple cries of revolution or panaceas. And I'm sure that you will be ready to weed out any ill-founded notions that you come across, and you'll demand the critical tests and the evidence and a well-developed vision for the future. Much of what the barcoding proponents are saying seems to have a new ring to it, but for the most part it's not new at all. Providing a means for identification is not new, of course. It's coextensive with what we do in taxonomy. If a name has meaning at all, then we have to provide a means to transmit that information. The potential use of sequence or genomic data, of course, is also not new. We have studies where we've used mitochondrial and ribosomal data. We've used alizyme analyses, competitive PCR, DNA hybridization, so on and so forth for selective taxa for the right instances and at the right time in the research project. Gathering and using a standard set of sequences across many or all taxa, this was discussed back in the 90s, so that idea isn't new either. In fact, even using the term, even though Sperling credited or bear with the, the term DNA barcoding, um, that term was actually used in 1993 in a paper by Arnaud for exactly the same thing, using genomic data to barcode identification. Well, there must be something new. Perhaps it's just an unjustified and uh, a reliance on uh, DNA data, to, including a notion that out there there are clusters of DNA that when they're pulled together have necessarily some biological meaning. Though that's a rather phonetic idea, which isn't new. There is this sort of new and unfortunate analogy to the universal products code, but of course we know that biological entities evolve and change and interbreed and have common histories of more or less depth. Kansas soup have none of those. But this sort of typological thinking underlies the whole program, and of course typological thinking isn't new. The concerted effort that they put together with all of the institutions, that I commend. That's quite an achievement although there are many programs or a few programs like Pete, like Tree of Life, which are already large community programs that are up and running and are doing the right thing. In the end, as I see it, what is new is not good and what's good isn't new. There are really three related things. 
Um, and Paul touched on these during his talk, and I like to divide them out because there's, there's, I have different thoughts about them. First, there's vouchering of DNA and databases of selected sequences. There's DNA taxonomy, and then there's DNA barcoding identification. The vouchering, absolutely, it's a great idea. I have no problem with this. We should, of course, be enhancing our museum collections, and we should absolutely have real vouchers associated with all of our sequences that go into GenBank. But, of course, this isn't science. This is just a good use of the data that's available, especially if we have adequate funding for our museums and personnel. DNA taxonomy, on the other hand, is actually a scientific enterprise, the exclusive use of DNA to, to uh, sequence data to describe and define our taxa. But of course, this, I would say, is a very bad science. It's clearly tied to DNA barcoding identification. And in fact, <clears throat> it's been promoted by many of the same promo uh, proponents. It suffers from uh, both of these, DNA taxonomy and DNA barcoding identification, suffer some, from some very fundamental problems, problems that we understand well in the systematics community that were known even in Darwin's time. Probably this is a fairly familiar paragraph to most of you. He said in the first part of it that a classification founded on any single character, however important that may be, has always failed. We know that the complexity and the historical contingency of nature demands that any of our studies from the beginning draw on a variety of data types or we're doomed to fail. Later in the same paragraph, he quotes Linnaeus and says that the characters do not give the genus, but the genus gives the characters. What this means for us is that the correct order is to first build our phylogenetic relationships and develop our classifications and then we know the defining characters of the taxa. DNA taxonomy and barcoding identification simply have this backwards and therefore represent a backslide into typological thinking. DNA taxonomy figures prominently in the DNA barcoder's view of the world. In fact, Paul would tell us that what we need to do is to first and mandatory step in our taxonomy is to have gene species. Specifically, DNA barcoding identification is not research. It's not scientific. Taxonomy is scientific. Okay? Identification tools are one of the products of our field of systematics and taxonomy, but they are not the purpose of our discipline. Some prominent biologists still misunderstand this and would rate your works, your monographs, your phylogenies, and so forth as mere service products. On a number of occasions, Dan Jansen has specifically relegated your taxonomic products to the category of necessary collaterals. Herbert and others have mischaracterized systematics and taxonomy. We see here, he says, if taxonomists fail to embrace molecular technology, and he says, there's no more likely death of a discipline than the failure to innovate. Look at your own work and the work driven by the peat supported lab groups. There's no failure to innovate here. This statement is nothing more than an attempt to denigrate taxonomy in the hope that barcoding would have the appearance of an advance. In another publication, he's quoted saying, Taxon in reference to taxonomy, that there's also probably no discipline that has been so little impacted by technology. The statement is simply wrong. Throughout history of taxonomy and systematics, every type of technology, hand lens, the microscope, the SEM, various genetic methods, all kinds of computer applications have all eagerly been applied by taxonomists and systematists to visualize and discover our characters. What we have not done, and what we should not do, is allow the fact that we have technology to discover new characters drive our decision as to which hypotheses we should accept. What about the methodology? Well, the methodology has been presented so far remains confused and problematic. 
Why the non-scientific and apparently non-phylogenetic DNA barcoding identification methods use phylogenetic methods is very confused and confusing and is not well explained. At a recent International Congress of Entomology, I read a barcoding poster by Shelley Ball, one of the uh, authors on the original DNA barcoding paper. And on it first she states that closely related sequences grouped together in the tree and that she used an evolutionary rate substitution model, the K2P model, to correct for uh, substitution error. And then says, the resulting tree is not a phylogeny, it's a profile. Well, what does that mean? What is this profile? Why would we use phylogenetic methods and then not call it a phylogeny? There's some fundamental confusion in the methodology that just is not well explained. There's some very basic things about the methodology that we know are problematic. How about issues on input order, a very fundamental thing to look at. Deanna Lipscomb presented at the most recent Hang meeting results of a reanalysis of the original Herbert et al. data showing that accuracy is dependent on input order. Well, maybe we can avoid all this by using these Euclidean distances that we see in some of the publications. <clears throat> this is clearly non-phylogenetic, but then again, it doesn't seem to have a clear connection to what species are or how we should delimit or identify them. For example, on the uh, barcoders webpage, there's a uh, recent posting of a paper by Hogan Herbert on 19 of the 50 Canadian Arctic columbola species that's on the barcoding of those species. And he presents us with this, they present us with this figure number two, which is a multidimensional scaling of Euclidean distances for CO1 for the 19 species. And we're told that in each case, individuals of the same nominate species group together. Well, let's have a closer look. If you look closely, you see that species and genera sometimes clump on top of each other, sometimes they're spread out widely. Exactly what's going on here is, clear, is, is definitely not clear and it's not explained in the text. And I pull this example out because I think the methodology in general simply has not been evaluated properly. As good systematists, you must demand better and a better accounting for the methods before you can even consider giving DNA barcoding a prominent role in your research. What about the mitochondria, the, the sort of holy grail of the DNA barcoding? Is it really any good? There's a lot of d data out there about the mitochondrial genes. And what we know is not that pretty. We know that not all the mitochondria in every cell are the same. There is mitochondrial heteroplasmy. I know from a talk and manuscript I've seen from Rudolf Meyer, he has hundreds of fly sequences he's been working with, CO1, and he finds that some of the species have identical CO1 sequences. Now remember that there is no necessary change in the mitochondria that either causes or is caused by speciation. So we should expect all of those kinds of patterns. Many of you probably have read the paper by Funk and Omland that listed a lot of problematic uh, issues re related to paraphyletic patterns in their gene trees. And there's such processes of introgression, hybrid speciation, incomplete lineage sorting, and so forth, all can lead to those kinds of problems. And those are going to lead to problems with understanding what species are and identifying them. And then there are nuclear pseudogenes, these mitochondrial transposons that can be amplified in PCR. And we found those in grasshoppers, aphids, cats, primates, and even ground beetles. For those of you who don't know, I work on ground beetles. <laughs> Well, what about all this success? We've seen lots of success in the previous presentation. Well, when you go to the website, you only see about 1,000 species listed. Of course, Paul is presented with a lot more data. Maybe I haven't seen those as are publications coming out. But when you go there, you sum up what they've got. They've got about 900 and, and some on the website. These have been highly selective studies with relatively low sample numbers. And they are typically from systems where allopatry is almost certainly the most likely cause of speciation, which means Yes, you're going to find those nice, well-defined, long branches between species. Where are all the recently divergent species? Did evolution stop a million or two years ago? I don't think so. We need more studies, more careful studies, and more thorough studies. I think we'll see them coming soon. What about the cost? Well, the actual dollar amount is unimportant. We, we, you know, we like to throw these numbers you know, around because we want to sound like 
or NASA. But it doesn't really matter. The dollar amount is not really the important thing here. The real cost to be the loss in the productivity and systematics, the loss of funding and training to students who do exactly the things that the PEEP program does. We should be investing in the option value of the future, not the quick buck. The end result of a global effort to barcode life would at best only be a telephone book of life, not the encyclopedia of life that we want to produce. Is there any use at all? Well, there's the databasing, which I spoke of. That's fine. Potential for a tool, in some cases, after the taxonomy of a group is completed. You have to have a few more than one and a half million names for those 10 million to 100 million things out there before you can apply this tool. So is our taxonomy complete enough? That's a rhetorical question. Who's going to do this taxonomy if we start turning our attention towards just grabbing sequences? And in the end, who will be around to correct the errors when we have sequences, identifying sequences, with no taxonomist to fix it? In summary, I would say that in general, the barcoding idea has not been promoted in the scholarly manner it should have. There are many questions in terms of the methodology. Critical tests remain to be done. Tests that have been done have been highly selective. There's been a broad mischaracterization of systematics and taxonomy and a gross overstatement of the utility of the mitochondrial DNA. DNA data for identification may be used only after our taxonomy is done. DNA barcoding identification is not science. It distracts from the real objectives of systematics and reliance on DNA barcode identification will lead to DNA taxonomy. The result will be a highly deficient product, the telephone book of life at best, not the encyclopedia of life. DNA barcoding is the anti pete Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that. Now again, I appreciate you've got many questions. We'll get onto the debate very soon, but there's just one more little thing that I wanted to do before we get to that debate. And when I was putting this session together, it occurred to me that many of you might not really be familiar with what goes on in DNA barcoding, what it's all about, how does it work. And so I thought, what better opportunity than to have a little experiment, a little, not a test, a demonstration, if you like, of some of the principles involved in DNA barcoding. In this audience today, we've got people from a working on a diverse selection of organisms from all around the world. So what I'd like to do, your challenge, if you choose to accept it, is to compare your taxonomic expertise with that of our untrained students in a little, a little race to do some identifications. So what I've got in this box are five specimens, five biological specimens that correspond to the expertise in this audience. And on my laptop over there, we've got five DNA sequences from these five specimens. And we're going to have this little race to see, to compare, if you like, who's, who's, who's best, who can identify these things. Now, these specimens, this isn't, as I say, this isn't a test. It's really meant to demonstrate and illustrate some of the principles and some of the problems associated with DNA barcoding. So, if I could have our students come up, and if Paul, ably assisted, if they could be ably assisted by Paul, could come up to this computer. What we have here, as I say, are these five sequences, and also some of the resources that are, they're going to need to be able to identify them. And if Kip could take our box of specimens, and what I'd like him to do is if he can pass those specimens out, maybe he can make some pseudo-identification for them. Now, we all appreciate that this isn't a real example. That this is not perfect situations at all. You haven't got the resources to properly identify these. They're not, they're not especially hard. But each of these specimens have been chosen, as I say, to illustrate some of the pr problems and some of the principles associated with at least the species identification angle for DNA barcoding. So we give it sort of about five, maybe ten minutes. We'll see how we do. And um, uh, there, if you need access to any of your wonderful PEAT websites, you can use this laptop up here. We've even got, there's a dissecting scope here, should anyone want to use it. And at the very least, there's a hand lens. So 
If I, if I, if I can give you that, the kip, probably, if you take that, because you probably will need it. So we'll give it sort of about five, ten minutes, and we'll see how you do. Okay. Oh, great. <laughs> so what we want... Let's just quit that properly and uh, see if we can find it again. Leech, but yeah, what about a reboot? Yeah, maybe. Some leech people? <laughs> I wonder whether they tried to plug that in right. What we might, because like yesterday we had a problem with the connection down here. Uh, let's just switch it so that we can get it in. Is it German? <laughs> okay, I'll try that. They put it on a hub, and uh, there it goes. Try. Uh, okay. Okay. So what you've got there, there are in there, there are five sequences in.
be on the big screen. Just a few more minutes now. Well, our morphologist, morph the morphologists have done. I don't know how the barcode is doing. Are you, you're done ago. long ago. <laughs> right. Let's get started then. 
to do it properly, I'd have to give our students a PCR machine, some Gilsons, and set them going. You need the resources, you need the keys, you need the internet access, you need all the other things that you would normally have, the normal trappings of traditional systematics to be able to identify these things. But the point of this was really just to illustrate a few principles. So let's just quickly run through these things. Um, and so if I'm, what I'll do first of all, let's look at specimen one. What did our morphologists have for specimen one? Uh, we have Bivalvia is the class. Uh huh. Heter I don't know if I can read the handwriting here. Heteropankia. Uh huh. Uh, Venerity. And that's as far down as we went. That's as far as you've gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. And our, our, our barcoding team? Oh, it was a fossil, so we had no DNA. Yep. So this is a bit of a cheat. <laughs> <laughs> and this was really the. Actually, I should notice the person who did it wrote down probably a sub-fossil. Probably a sub-fossil. Okay, well, they did well then. This was, of course, really just to illustrate the point that there are a vast number of specimens for which DNA barcoding will never be of any use to us. Unless you can get in a time machine and go back and collect some DNA, I don't think DNA barcoding is ever going to be much use for fossilized paleontological material or these kind of sub-fossils. So really that was the, the point to make with specimen one. So that's a, a miss for the barcoders. Specimen two, probably a little bit easier, this one. Morphologists? Uh, class Insecta, order Coleoptera, family Scarabidae, and it's uh, Melantha, Melantha. Yep. And it has a common name, I guess, which yes. is... Well, can you read that? It's, it's my kefa. <laughs> oh, my kefa, okay. But, but the, the Scarab team found, the, found even the term name for that, which is correct. <laughs> Excellent. And our barcoders, what did you have? We only got to Melavonta species. Okay. Has been well, you got, the, you got the genus right. That's good. So the point that I wanted, wanted to illustrate with this, this is in fact uh, a maybug. Uh, we call it maybug in the UK. They're very common in Europe, but they're not actually... Um, as I'm told, they're not present in the US. And the point that I wanted to make here is that really a lot of taxonomic expertise is often geographically limited. You also know about the bugs and beasts in your own area. The DNA barcoding doesn't discriminate. It doesn't need to be local, as long as it's in the database. <laughs> Specimen three, a tricky one. Morphologists. Uh, we got classes, Oligochaeta, order Herodinia, Herodinia. Uh, and the family is Irpodeliidae with a question. Right. Yep. Yep. This is a leech. We know that much. Barcoders. Yeah. Is that the three? I don't know if it's me. Okay, well, that's me. I'll, I'll come over here. The family is Irpodeliidae. Uh, genus Irpodella. Irpodella punctata. So you got that the species. Yep. This is, in fact, a very common leech, so I'm told. It uh, has a widespread distribution, very common in the US, and not very distinctive. <laughs> so, again, the point here was really just to make that there are a wealth of specimens on our doorstep for which we have no real idea what these things are. It's very hard for us to identify when these things are very, have very few characteristic features. Specimen four. Now, you'll remember that I said there was the expertise in the audience to identify all of these things. Well, I lied. This one, there is no PEAT program for. I've been told to say, though, there should be one. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did, our, what did our morphologists have? Uh, we only got Insecta, Socoptera, and then somebody who knew the answer declined to give it. Okay, right. Yes, there is someone who does know the answer in the audience. And our barcode? So here's a copy of the next competition. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who wants it, come up and take it. Okay, uh, we didn't get very good hit, uh, good, uh, hit, be, hit percentage on this, so uh, we identified as a staphyl in it. Mm -hmm. a, a species of Staphylinid. Okay. So we're unsure and it might be a pseudogene, that's right. Right, well, that, yeah, so clearly that, that one was uh, wrong. This is a Cocteran. Uh, it's actually a new, be over here. This is actually a new species. Uh, and of course, this really just emphasizes the point that DNA barcoding is only going to work if you've got enough sequences in there to compare it against. Um, this being a new species and there being no peak program, there's very few DNA sequences in which you can make these comparisons with. So that's specimen four. 
Specimen five. Well, uh, morphologist. Uh, this this fungi is a Bacidomycetes, and we got it all the way down to Amanita muscaria, the fly uh -huh. agaric. That's right. Yep. And uh, I have a feeling our barcoders have a slightly stranger answer. Yeah, we got to Homo sapiens. Right. <laughs> We had a hint it was a contaminant, though. <laughs> so this was really just to emphasize the point that vouchering is going to be essential. Even the most rudimentary taxonomists can tell the difference between a fungus and a human. But there's going to be many cases where things that are very, very similar are, are going to be much harder to identify. Screw-ups in the lab happen all the time. We all know about them from time to time. So the point that I wanted to make here is that vouchering is going to be essential for some of these. Okay, so a very quick run through of a few key points then. There are many specimens that are not suitable for barcoding. Fossilized and extinct taxa are a good example. We're going to get on to this next one in a minute, so we'll skip that for the moment. Many taxa are extremely difficult to identify morphologically. There's all sorts of immature specimens with no obvious uh, discriminating features. There are plenty of cryptic taxa out there as well, hard to identify. There are no specialists for many taxa. As successful as Pete is, is it really scratching, doing more than just scratching the surface of the problem? That I'm going to leave that one in the, open, in the air. Probably the main thing for me that I wanted to illustrate with this is that there was no training necessary for our barcoding team. I mean, okay, they would have had to have known how to do PCR and had to, had to generate those sequences to start with. But they basically just pressed a few buttons to get those identifications. And of the ones that they had any chance of getting, they didn't do too badly. In contrast, the expertise amongst this peat audience is exceedingly expensive, and it only lives in you and your publications that you, you produce. So again, I'll, I'll just leave that point hanging. And finally, it's worth noting that actually barcoding for identifications is already in use for many taxa. Many of the, the bacteria people, the mycologists, all sorts of new revelations are coming to light about fungal classification as a result of some aspects of DNA barcoding. The cetaceans, this is a, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. This is a good example where barcoding is being put to the test in a real practical situation. There's lots of illegal trade in whale meat, and people are using DNA barcoding in uh, Japan and uh, Australia and New Zealand to actually identify these whale meat samples. And there's a very good team going on there. Okay, so now we're going to move to our main event, if you like, our debate. So if I could ask, Martin's already there, if our two barcoders can come up, uh, if our, uh, Paul and Kip can come up. Uh, okay. Um, in, a, in anticipation of this, some of you may well have seen it, but I put a, uh, a couple of quest requests out on some mailing lists uh, for people to submit questions in advance of this meeting. And we received about 30 viable replies. We received more replies than that, but 30 viable replies, of which I've kind of distilled them down to around about 10 or 11 questions. And we're going to run through these, and our students are going to uh, read them out, and then we're going to have the opportunity for Paul and Kip to comment on them. Whether we stick to those questions during this section or not, I, I don't know. It will probably depend upon you and how much you want to chip in. So we may, we may skip over some of these questions. Okay. What are the barcode? Oh, Richard Pyle from the British Museum asked, "What are the barcoding regions, and what are the properties that make them useful?" Can we get the mic back? Yeah, they're recording it though. 
Okay. <laughs> okay, so what are the barcoding regions and what are the properties that make them useful? I think we can probably dispense with this one quite quickly because we've already heard a little bit about that. In particular, perhaps, if Paul could comment on what are the barcoding regions for the, for, for the non-animals because we've already seen that the one of them, this, this gene, cytochrome oxidase 1, this mitochondrial gene, does work quite well in some cases for, for animals, although there are many problems. And maybe if Kip could think about some of these problems, but if you want to comment on that, particularly perhaps with plants and protists and fungi. Sure. But maybe just comment very quickly on a couple of the points that uh, Kip raised in relation to the difficulties with CO1 in animals, frankly. Uh, many of them are perceived difficulties when you actually try and do it. They're not difficulties. Pseudogenes, for example, are often promoted as a big problem. They're very easily recognized. Almost all pseudogenes are short. Um, there are lots of complications that have been thrown up, but the fact is the practical work that's being done hasn't encountered uh, vast amounts of movement of mitochondria from one species to another. The papers show that. Um, in terms of other groups of organisms, the, to the topology of sequence divergence in protists and fungi makes it pretty clear that CO1 should be an excellent gene in both of those groups. There are now pilot studies ongoing in marine algae uh, and in uh, some selected protist groups that are showing that CO1 really without any complications is quite effective, far more effective than the standard ribosomal genes that are used in those groups which just lack adequate resolution. Um, there are problems in fungi associated with introns. The nice thing about animal genomes is they're quite clean of introns. Uh, big introns in some fungi are going to complicate analytical protocols. We'll probably be moving to RT-PCR for that work. But there are a number of uh, groups uh, gearing up to begin to develop those procedures. In terms of plants, the Smithsonian has an active program now uh, in Costa Rica to try and barcode all of the plants of Costa Rica, the higher plants. And that's based on two target gene regions. That project will start in January. It's just at a pilot stage. Uh, I think it's a little early to be sure what gene regions are going to be uh, used at the end of the day in prokaryotes. But uh, there's good reason to uh, think there that just a handful of genes, um, there are a few, few groups doing prokaryote work and finding that despite the uh, gene movement and these, the, the ease with which they move around blocks of DNA that you can actually pick out a small number of regions and use this to diagnose taxa. Okay. So I don't know if Kip you want to respond to that, but particularly in terms of some of these other genes, I mean, the, my, my perception is that there, there aren't many candidate genes for, for some of these other groups, or they're not they're not, they're not really, um, they're not properly evolved or, or developed particularly well yet. I don't know whether you want to comment on I that. I guess if you mean by developed in terms of the, the sampling and our understanding of the variation in the genes. Even the, the practical pilot studies that have been done so far are probably not severe enough tests because we know the problems are, do occur in the mitochondria, with mitochondria. Um, Look for some publications that are going to come out right out of the, some of the people that are in the, the, the barcoding uh, program, like uh, Chris Meyer, who works on calories. He has an incredible data set of thousands of sequences of calories, and he's looking at it in terms of coalescence depth. And this is the kind of study that's necessary to begin to find out if this is really for real. Okay. Um, when I've talked with Chris and seen the work he's done, looking at him, Whatever divergence level you pick, it's about 80% accuracy. So we had to decide, you know, if that's really what we're going to find across animals, is 80% good enough? Likely to be good enough for some studies and not for others. We also need to know, you know, any given taxon, whether that one is subject to more or less problems. So there's a lot of work to be done. So we, if we go out and we just start blindly sampling as fast and as much as we can, we're probably wasting a lot of energy. Okay, I, I should point out that if any of the audience have any po comments they want to make at any time, just simply raise your hand. We've got a couple of uh, students with microphones that can come up and capture your comment. But at any point during this, if you've got anything to say, just, just raise your hand and we'll come to you. Okay, I think we'll move to, um, we'll move to the next question then. 
Martin. Yeah. Um, David Fitch from New York University asks, would the DNA barcode represent a definition of a species? So I think this is kind of getting like, like the kind of diagnosis that you would have in a traditional taxonomic uh, description. Would you, Paul, would you see that DNA sequence, if you like, relate, how would you see it relate to that? I mean, is that the way you envisage that sequence or? I think the position of the Consortium for Barcode of Life is pretty clear on this. I mean, we're interested in a total evidence approach. Uh, barcode of Life program has never suggested describing species simply on the basis of a DNA sequence, and frankly, I can't imagine why that would ever happen. I mean, one has the organism, the specimen pages, uh, you know, they're linked into all the vouchers, have images on them, so I can't imagine descriptions would ever devolve down just to a sequence. On the other hand, I think uh, in those groups that don't attract serious taxonomic attention, creating draft taxonomic systems, and basing provisional descriptions on uh, sequence information, image of specimen, deposition of specimen in museum, may be uh, a necessary step really to set the stage for a full-blown taxonomic analysis. Later, allow those that needed taxonomy to get one uh, in place on a provisional basis for a period of time. So sequences alone are not sufficient uh, for a description. Well, I guess there you have it. This isn't one character taxonomy, would be my, my perspective. I mean, you, you portray DNA barcoding as potentially one character taxonomy in terms of uh, the, these, these alpha taxonomic descriptions. So uh, Paul's not supposedly not advocating that we just use that barcode as a descriptor. It's a kind of a, a first step, I guess. What's wrong with that? Well, there's actually uh, two things. One is that, that, in fact, you know, the using a single barcode, which we know that there's some non-independence among those sets of bases, and so they are subject to the same histories and biases that, that they have because of the peculiar breeding system, or the, the system that mitochondria has that's peculiar to it. And so we need more and different kinds of data to be able to actually estimate what species are. If you go out and you just carve the world into things that are 3% different, okay, you really are just making a phonetic system. It's typological. It has all those bad things that we know are, are wrong. We know there's problems with them. And if we use that as the first thing that we do, it'll be the only thing that's going to get done. It's almost certain. But once you've, once you've put so much time and energy into that, funding agencies and people will say, but wait, haven't you, you've already done the preliminary taxonomy. We don't need to do any more. We're, that's good enough. Do you, you want to respond to that, Paul? Well, I, yeah, I would actually like to respond to it because I think it raises a really important uh, question about what is the mission of the Barcode of Life program. And it certainly isn't uh, for people with interest in genomics to grab a large amount of money and not develop strong partnerships with members of the biodiversity community. The budget for the project, early days, maybe $2 billion for animals, maybe it's a billion dollars. It's a significant pile of change. But the belief always was that about 20% of that money will be directed towards the sequence analysis. 80% will be directed towards collection and curation of specimens and building linkages into the people that understand organismic diversity. There's never been a thought that this can be done without the sort of partnerships that uh, reside in PEAT. But it's building new coalitions. It's a total information. It's, it's bringing molecules and morphology together. It's not molecules walking alone. Any points from our audience? Anyone want to make any remarks? Yep, at the back. Oh, sorry. So, <laughs> sorry. I'll start here. Off okay, start, start there, yeah. I, I just had the comment of what would happen if you have the genetic barcoding community recognized, and you talked about automated species discovery, so you recognize that something is different based on DNA, but what happens if it's an organism that there's no ex taxonomic expert for. So then it's recognized by the barcoding as being a species, but it has yet to have a formal description. It, it can see a lot of problems, especially with rare taxa, um, with that sort of a system. Well, I think it is, it is going to be a problem, and that's one of the fallouts, I think, of a large scale DNA barcoding exercise is that a number, a large number probably, of new biological entities will be discovered. And we've only begun to think about how best to deal with that, and it'll be important to get advice from people like yourselves. At the moment, 
uh, a suggestion that's in this bird paper that we've advanced is that species would gain a provisional species status, PS. PS1, PS2, PS3, they're not species descriptions. They're referred to the nearest taxonomic group that an expert is available to place them in, and they're sitting there. The table is being laid, if you will, for taxonomic, uh, detailed taxonomic study later. But we'd like to have some uh, way of attributing and dealing with these organisms before they get a full-blown taxonomic description. They'll be deposited in museums. They'll be there for study. Yeah. Um, I'd like to make a, um, a question to, um, and a statement at the same time as a sceptic, somewhat sceptical of uh, the barcoding. Um, back in about 1988, I think, was the first time that I saw the advocacy of the use of um, DNA style technology, I think it was Alzheimer at the time, for association of immature stages of insects with their adults, and a more general claim has been made over the ensuing, what, 15 years or so, that this would be one of the major outcomes of DNA barcoding, would be able to associate poorly known life history stages, polymorphic stages, sexes, immature stages with their adults. So the claim is made very frequently, but I haven't seen a single instance yet. So what's going on? Is this a claim into the void to try and get the biodiversity community on site, systematists on site? Why has it not happened? Well, I mean, we did publish uh, our first paper on this in 2003, so that's not so long ago. I, I will admit that I have been working and did work in Alice for 30 odd years, and I mean, with an interest in biodiversity, one of the big goals was always develop uh, easily translatable identification system. That pretty much failed. There's a high level of subjectivity in the interpretation of Alice data, and a lot of difficulties in wrenching. Uh, comparable data sets out of diverse organisms. I feel very differently about uh, DNA sequences with the rise of the technology that's now available. And uh, these are early days, but I think it uh, isn't quite true that we're not doing uh, and haven't yet uh, published work that are linking together juvenile and adult stages. That work, uh, in fact, species descriptions are now appearing uh, and uh, with barcodes in them and we're working actively with groups of the Smithsonian and Discovery Biodiversity Regions in Papua New Guinea, where there are real difficulties, Scott Miller, real difficulties in their big tropical insect survey and in connecting males and females together, unless you find them in copula and they're sexually dimorphic. It's very difficult, and uh, I think it's fair to say that Scott is very pleased with early results, and we're now gearing up for quite a large analysis, 5,000 specimens this year from Papua New Guinea alone. Uh, and we've also worked uh, with Dan Jansen on some of his tropical uh, Costa Rican butterflies, highly diverse Hesperid communities, and uh, uh, he and John Burns are very pleased with the results, I would say. So I have a, con a, a question relating to Kip's concern about once we make an initial investment in DNA barcoding that we might not do the cleanup work of the alpha taxonomy that's required, and there's a model for this that's already been happening for the last 10 or 12 years, and, and I'm wondering if we've evaluated that community, and that's the, the bacteriologists who started collecting 16S ribosomal RNA sequences and now have, I guess, tens of thousands in, in a database program where they, they already use a typological species concept or a phonetic uh, species concept to delimit species based on percent sequence divergence of 16S. Yet I also know that there are alpha taxonomists who are still trying to do what we would consider proper alpha taxonomy as best they can with bacteria, which is a challenge. And I'm wondering if Kip's concern has come to pass in that community. Do you want, do you want to respond to that? I'm, I'm not that familiar with what has transpired in, in the bacteriologist's uh, work, so I, I can't say too much to that, other than it, it's sort of unsurprising. And what will happen is that if they come up with you know, typological units or phonetic units that other fields assume are good enough, the ecologist, the population biologist, the conservation people, the people in government who want a, a legal status for something, they may consider it good enough. But as, as systematists, as evolutionary biologists, we know that that's not good enough, that there is something else out there that's more real than our typological species concept, and that's what we need to be striving towards. But, I, I mean, I guess Paul would argue that, you know, we've already said that we're not just going to be, with this isn't one character taxonomy, we are using additional characters. So uh, it's, just a, it's just a who. That's the question. No, not who said it, but I mean who is going to be doing that. If, if people of this audience turn more or less of their attention and time and resources towards primarily gathering this database of barcoding and towards that kind of work, 
the only, it's only going to come from one place. It's going to come from our community, the people that need to be doing the cleanup work. Right? So I guess if there's people out there, you have people that are not systematist, and what they really want to do with life is collect DNA barcode data and database it, and there's still support for us to do our work, there's not a problem. But I don't think we're fighting over the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. We're fighting over the coin. Okay? And so we have to make that decision as to where to best put our efforts. Okay, time's getting short, so we'll, we'll skip the next question and move on to um, B1, it's got on here. Uh, so this is looking at this notion of DNA barcoding in species identification, and this was by far the most popular question, which pretty much everybody asked. So, Danielle, okay, you want to read so, it out? Yeah, everybody asked that. How will the DNA barcoding identifications deal with the overlap between intraspecific and interspecific variation documented in many groups? So, I mean, you, you pointed this out before in your presentation, um, but it, it's one, it's probably the fundamental concern which I think everybody, or the fundamental kind of practical concern that mo a lot of people have about this notion of DNA barcoding. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it's obviously obvious that nature did not create a species in units to make them simply diagnosable by DNA barcodes, and uh, evolution did not stop yesterday. So there will be young species and there will be old species. Uh, we do have a history, however, of understanding of how old most of the species are on the planet. If you talk to paleontologists, I mean, they have the deep time understanding of life that we as neontologists can't gain. And the average species lifespan uh, from the fossil record is millions of years, on average five, six, eight million years, depending on the group that you're taking a look at. These are units that can be easily diagnosed. So the fact is, from the fossil record, the expectation is most species that we live with have been here for a long time. So two, two problems. If you're going to use DNA barcodes for species diagnosis, you'd like to set the sequence threshold high so that we don't start creating all sorts of false positives. Don't start diagnosing all sorts of entities, distinct species, when really they're just minor variants on a single species. That's why we have established in this bird paper we're arguing that the threshold for diagnosis of a new species on barcodes alone would be 10 times the average intraspecific variation for the group. So if you do a ground truthing study on hundreds of species and find the average variation is a quarter of a percent, a reasonable threshold for species recognition is 10 times that. What that means is you'll only pick the most divergent things. Things have been on the planet for millions of years you will fail to recognize some of the young species. Is that a problem? It is a problem. We miss 5% of the species. But as I tried to point out in my uh, presentation, we'll be recognizing an equal number of species that long taxonomic study has overlooked. So no system is perfect. A barcode threshold needs to be set high to avo avoid false positives. Can we ever lower the threshold? That's where the detailed taxonomic and biological studies come in. We're doing a, a study now uh, in Costa Rica on a single species of skipper butterfly. That's the commonest butterfly in Costa Rica. This neat species was known to have a lot of food records, but it falls into 10 biological units. Uh, some of them very shallow, but that requires the collateral information. That requires the linkage to get, to push down the sequence thresholds. So there's this dialogue between traditional taxonomy and barcoding that allows you to develop diagnostic traits for really young species and the incredibly surprising phenomenology that has yet to be fully understood is why species with such different biologies have, have sequence divergences that coalesce in such, at such shallow times. A quarter of a percent means all of the columbulins of a species, all of these moths, all, all of the humans on the planet, we understand in our species that coalesce in time about 100,000 years, but can you believe that every animal species on the planet coalesced 100,000 years ago? Okay, we, we've got a question over there, and then maybe we'll, if, we'll, we'll maybe go to Kate. Well, it's not really a question. Um, I have just, uh, well, all right, I'm a uh, NSF observer, and so just to, I'm going to speak as a University of Alabama professor. Right, <laughs> so this is not necessarily endorsed by NSF. Is that okay, Jim? Is that legal in the uh, NSF circle? <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, 
when I first heard about the debate, I thought, my word, I feel sorry for Dr. Herbert, who's been much like an evolutionary biologist invited into a Methodist uh, church and the Bible Belt <laughs> to uh, debate evolution with a bunch of people who want to discuss uh, creation myths and play no role in science. However, uh, obviously you have the wall stacked up against you. Also, the other thing I was disappointed by was the fact that uh, it was cast as a debate, an either or sort of thing. Um, as uh, has been mentioned, uh, we've seen that the barcode already exists. To say anti-peat, I think if a uh, show of hands, who's using DNA in their peat projects, man? See, anybody dare raise their hand? Oh, oh, are you all anti-peat people because you're using DNA? No, I don't think so. Anyway, the whole point, in my opinion, is that DNA barcoding is something that excites the public because they see, they go to the grocery st store and they envision that little machine that you showed and they went, oh, that'd be really cool. You could take this thing like Star Trek and wave it across and we have our DNA sequence and other specimen in a second, right? And the barcode obviously can generate bukus of data and the sequence in its own right is meaningless. Uh, without the context, context, the morphology of the creature. And so we're going to race ahead. I hear comments about uh, what happens if they sequence this and no one's ever looked at it, and yada, yada. Well, it's meaningless. If you're going to click on the barcode, you're going to go to the web page, and it'll flash up a few nucleotides, and everybody can go, guanine. Oh, that's nice. That's lovely, lovely, lovely. Anyway, so but the point of that does not mean anything at all without the research. And so, and what I mean by the research component is, of course, people studying the organisms and uh, in all their glorious features. And in fact, when we also get down to the fact that the various percent differences, well, different taxonomic groups are going to show differences depending on the genes. Co-1 is never going to answer everything. And so uh, what I had been suggesting to people is that basically you embrace barcoding because people are going to throw money at it. and as Paul uh, mentioned, uh, taxonomists, rather than fighting over the last coin that you perceive is going to get taken away, you knock your DNA chip off your shoulder and you say, let's go with the ride here, people, and not fight one another, but just say, okay. While they're running ahead convincing the public that DNA park coding is the answer, you obviously still do what you do and you take a whole bunch of the money from that to do what you want to do and continue to do. And so, anyway, that was sort of my feeling. I really had to get it off my chest. I feel a lot better now, thank you. And, uh, well, I think now, now so we can hear the response. That's just my <laughs> thoughts on the matter. I think we need more peats and we need them to include DNA because as you've seen, uh, all those things make, all the DNA studies I've seen have actually identified cryptic species. Uh, they don't hide them. Most of the publications come out when they're identifying them. And what happens is you have a clade that most molecular phylogeneticists like myself will say, oh, okay, it's an unidentified species. And I collaborate with someone who's knowledgeable in taxonomy, taxonomy and morphology of that group all the time. And uh, they do the work to describe it formally and so on and so forth. So anyway, so the point is you don't take away from the good science. Just generating sequence doesn't take anything. My 11-year-old daughter can go in and do what I did for my dissertation uh, 12 years ago now, probably in a weekend. Uh, and so anyway, it's not a big deal. Anyway, so just okay, whatever that means. That. Yeah, please. Thanks for sharing. Um, <laughs> I, it, it, would be, it would be wrong to confuse the use of molecular data with DNA barcoding per se. I use molecular data. All of my students use molecular data. Those data are part of the organism just like every other character system. I use chemistry data. I use behavior. I use morphology. I use DNA, the whole, the whole nine yards. So to say that you're using DNA is not saying that you're doing DNA barcoding. Okay? They really are distinct and different things. And I'm still convinced that it's not about, you know, it's not a, a matter of, of whether there's a, uh, it's really about how many of us and how much of our energy should be put into directing our field forward. We can convince the public, you can tell them whatever what, but you are not the public. You are the scientists doing the work. 
You're the ones that have to evaluate the work, and you're the ones that have to determine the amount of time and resources that go into your projects and what your monographs, if you produce monographs, are going to look like. So there's two ways you can, well, there's not two ways. You're right. There are middle roads. You can apply this tool where it's appropriate. First, you go in and you build taxonomy expertise, and you have the names down. We only have one and a half million names out there already. We need more work on more names. And if DNA barcoding sequence data, whatever that data is, whether it's from the mitochondria or whatever, is useful to provide tools for identification, and it can be tied to databases and vouchered specimens, that's great. But it's really what the priority is. And the priority still needs to be producing the taxonomy. Okay. I think time is pressing. So, again, we'll move on to... Um, I think our next question has kind of been covered. So let's, let's look at this issue of a, a B3 and C1. I think if you can read out B, uh, B3 and probably combine it with C1, because I think these two touch on, on, on very similar areas, and, and Kip touched on these issues within the context of his his presentation. And, and maybe if Kip can kind of explain a little bit about what, what these mean first, once we've heard the question, and then Paul can respond to that. Uh, Jim Hayden from the Cornell University asks, is accuracy of identification to the right clade possible in the absence of accuracy in family and genus level topology? And uh, the second question, kind of the C1 question uh, of Daniel uh, Funk, um, he asks, how confident can we be in the, ability, uh, in the utility of DNA barcodes to discover new species when it has been demonstrated that many species are not uh, mitochondrially monophyletic and thus share mitochondrial polymorphisms with other species? If you can just explain a little bit about what, what those questions are trying to get at, and then we'll, we'll, we'll put those to, to Paul. Well, I think the, the first one addresses the basic issue of, of whether you actually have a phylogeny already. And if you have a phylogeny built for the group and you have a classification for that, it may or may not be consistent with the phylogeny that you would build using CO1. If it's not consistent with that, and if you're using phylogenetic methods for identification, you're going to have problems placing those terminals into your identification system because they're not going to be the same. Now, maybe all we need is CO1 to do our phylogenies because then we could obviously have correct identifications all the time because we would just pick our point of divergence and we would name our clades according to that. But I don't think that's what we want to do. So there's always going to be some contention here. If you use 18S or 28S or wingless or other genes and that's your best phylogeny and it's not consistent with CO1, you're going to have trouble placing things in those higher level phylogenies. Uh, the second half of the question, um, well, if you if you've read, and I imagine most all of you read the uh, Funk and Omlin paper and other papers on the mitochondria, you know that there are significant issues in terms of coming up with a gene tree using the mitochondria that looks like paraphyletic species. And this is partly going to fall back onto what your species concept is. So if you go into that and you already have a particular species concept, and let's say it's interbreeding, then it doesn't matter whether those look paraphyletic in a gene tree or not. If you're concept is more typological, then you've got to deal with those arrangements. Do you name all of those individuals in the grade or don't you? Okay. So there's, there's an issue there. Part of it is an issue of like understanding the mitochondria and part of it is selecting your, uh, your species concept. Okay, thanks. Paul. Yeah, I guess the first uh, thing I'd point out is the Barcode of Life program has a, a pretty clear, clear direction and that is to try and delineate the leaves on the tree of life, not to work out the deep interconnections. And uh, that's the Tree of Life project. That's a project that requires multi-genes, bringing big genomic uh, effort to bear on trying to get the best possible resolution because a lot of the important uh, explosions of life on our planet occurred very, very quickly, and it's real difficult to make decisions about branch order. So that isn't what the barcode of life is about. The barcode of life is about creating tools that make it possible to delineate species and recognize species when one encounter them. And so the issue that Funk and Omland raise is certainly a real one. It's one of the complications that Kip pointed out as potential things that might get in the way and make barcoding a very uncertain exercise. I mean, they do argue that uh, from their case history studies that about 20% of animal species show 
uh, mitochondrial complexities, paraphyly, and so on. But the, the question uh, I think you have to ask, is this a random sample of all the animal species on the planet? These studies were case studies. Case studies are ordinarily driven because people encounter unexpected events or interesting situations. There's been an enormous amount of work done on the cichlid fishes of the African lakes. They're a very interesting system, but the, the bulk of fish species on the planet don't seem to follow the cichlid species rapid radiation mode. So I argue that uh, the Funkinomala study is flawed in the sense that it's based on case studies and in fact that it doesn't give us a good understanding of the sorts of complexities we're likely to encounter if we look at life at large. And as evidence, we have the studies that we're doing that are trying to look at. So we're slowly building up. I mean, we will finish continental faunas this year, but our near-term goal is global barcode uh, assessments on families with 1,000 to 5,000 species. Then we'll know for sure. Okay, we've got a question and a comment or a comment over there. Um, yeah, I, I think this whole issue of whether we're talking about the tree of life or the leaves at the tips is really fundamental to a lot of the things that you've presented, Paul, because basically you drew a distinction between benthic and, and pelagic cnidarians and how there's a difference. Well, those aren't natural units. There are many things that are, have a pelagic lifestyle um, and may vary in the, over their life um, in that lifestyle going from a benthic to a pelagic existence. And so we need to be very precise and understanding those relationships of the tree and how we speak is fundamental to doing that. Secondly, um, in you're talking about your case studies where there are, are distances between um, species in the same genus. Uh, we need to talk about what relationships there in order to be able to interpret that fundamentally because we can have lots of things that are placed in the, the same um, taxon, but their relationship within that clade is fundamental to knowing their phylogenetic and, and genetic proximity. And we have to know, for example, what I would be interested in is knowing the genetic distances between sister taxa, recently evolved species. And, and we really need just having them in the same genus provides very little information about whether we're making accurate comparisons or not. Yeah, I think the gold standard test for barcoding, of course, is can it tell every possible sister species uh, a pair apart? And the answer is those are the, those are the toughest decisions to make. Work on birds indicates about 5% sequence divergence for sister species pairs. There's uh, the Impidinax genus has 15 species in, it in North America. They're recognized as some of the most difficult bird species to tell apart. Uh, there are only three, if I'm uh, not mistaken, three of the possible 15 times 14, uh, 105 possible pairwise comparisons with 15 species, only three of those that fall under the 2.7% threshold that we use So, as a, as a criterion for rec easily recognizing species. So uh, the sister species issue is a challenge. And you know, if, you can, if the bar keeps rising, there will be more and more cases that you know, if you restrict analysis simply to the most similar species on the planet, yes, we'll find cases where barcodes will fail, but I think you will be surprised at how often we find monophyletic, easily diagnosable assemblages even in shallowly diverged life. This will only be tested by careful study, and we're at the early stages of this now. Last year it was hundreds of species, now it's thousands. And within three years, uh, there will be robust studies that will have looked at at least 50,000 species on the planet. Okay, I think that it's time for maybe one more question. So if we go for D1. Okay. Jim Hayden from Cornell University. He asks, what will be the role of system, system, systematists in a world where most identifications are done by barcode, and will the expansion of sequencing efforts come at the expense of systematics in general? I guess this one is for Paul first, really. Well, it's, uh, I don't believe that most practicing taxonomists, systematists derive great pleasure out of doing fairly routine identification, at least the ones that I have consorted with, uh, you know, vast numbers of aphids showing up at your desk from someone's rose plant, tell me what it is. That's not the most productive use of the sort of talents that people have. So if at the end of the day we have a highly refined identification system based on DNA, I see this as a great enabling device for all sorts of scientific areas and a freeing up 
of some of the time of taxonomic experts. Creating this system is going to create an awful lot of work for uh, traditional taxonomic work. So it's not that. There isn't going to be a, a loss of jobs in the same way we no longer have people shoeing horses and doing things like that uh, or making papyrus scrolls now that we've got printing presses. There isn't going to be that loss of job for any foreseeable time. And actually, I think it will mean a very tiny shift in the job description. I mean, clearly what we're all interested in here is understanding the diversity of life and how this diversity of life arose. And that is the business of systematists and taxonomists. And that's the barcode of life is going to be an enabler to, to that end goal. I mean, this is a, we're all traveling to Rome. There are a bunch of ways to get there. And uh, the question is, are we fellow travelers or doing the traditional biological community thing of ringing their wagons and shooting inwards? It's, it's, it's not the best way to convince the broader community that we should support an area of science. OK, I'm going to cut you off. Uh, get a chance to respond because we're get ahead of or behind schedule. Well, of course, I think we've sort of covered this question quite a bit, actually. Um, I, don't, I don't think any of us think that our primary role is to provide identifications, although I think most all of us do that to some degree, and I think most all of us derive a little bit of pleasure out of it. Um, but we don't want to be burdened with that all the time. So certainly we want more and better tools for identification. Now, whether uh, the road is, of the barcoders is actually going to Rome or Milan is, is, a, is the real question. Okay? And um, I think that uh, it's not clear that this is the best, best path and where we should put our primary energy. Okay, thanks very much. I think we're now moved to the... Th are there any more comments? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've got a comment. I'm a, one of the few ecologists here. I'm a user of taxonomy, and I clearly want identification. And I, in some ways, very much support the barcode of life, and I also clearly support Lucid and Discover Life's efforts to do different types of identification. Dan Jensen, and he's not here to defend himself, has been one of the real proponents of this, and I mean, in the, in the case of the skippers with John Burns, you really do need a DNA sequence to tell those things apart, or you have to have John Burns identifying millions and millions of things. But I think one of the things you, we really need to be doing is saying, look, where it, it really is, as Chuck said, not an either or. And I would sort of say to you, you you're getting this criticism for this project now because you're saying it's going to cost $2 billion, and the rest of it's going, well, that leaves nothing less for us. If you came in, I feel that I and Lucid and the people in this room could do identification tools on the web using images and this, that, and the other for about uh, $20 million for 90% of life. The rest of the things, those tape runs, I don't want my kids in the schools going, oh, God, there's no characters. We can't do it. That's where you need a, a barcode of life. Everybody then can use the 90% cheap tool. And then when it doesn't work, or it says you've got to take one, go to your cooperative extension agency or Kroger or plug it into the machine, you cut your budget down to 200 million because you've got 10% left. We, we do it very quickly. And it's just a sort of compromise rather than saying it's, we've got to do all of life on the barcode of the life. And I, I know I can't do all of life, but I can certainly cream off with Lucid and the other guys that are the expertise in this room. We can get 90% there without DNA. Thank you. OK, I'm going to cut it off there. We're now going to move to some very brief final closing presentations from Paul and Kip. These are their executive summaries, if you like, about why, why we should be voting for the propositions or against. But I mean, you don't, don't get too hung up exactly on the wording of the propositions. So um, if, uh, actually, Martin, could you give me a hand with this table and we can get rid of it? First of all, I don't think it's very easy to deal with these two issues separately. They're, they're going to be the joint fallout of a large-scale 
DNA barcoding exercise. So I think what you need to ask is, first of all, what's the feasibility of executing a large-scale barcode program? What are the longer-term implications? From a technological perspective, uh, the challenges are small. The sequencing involved in a full-blown sequence analysis of animal life on the planet, five specimens per individual, 50 million individuals, is the throughput of a single major sequencing facility, an annual output. The imaging requirements, the databasing requirements are quite substantial, but require absolutely no new technology. If we're going to deliver on this, it's going to require organizational support, broad coalitions. I think those are emerging. The Consortium for the Barcode of Life, based at uh, the Smithsonian in Washington, has now been joined by about 40 organizations that have committed to trying to advance this. They include the world's major museums and a bunch of uh, individuals uh, and organizations involved in other endeavors that are supportive, including the commercial sector. The resource implications are high. They're a billion or so dollars. But, uh, you know, so often the argument I hear is that this is a zero-sum game, that we're fighting for minor amounts, uh, the minor amounts of money that are currently being directed to biodiversity science. That's completely the wrong way to look at this exercise. This program will uh, compete for funds with other major international science programs. It will compete with the funds for the next cyclotron or funds that might go into the International Space Center. We're going to redirect that money to the discovery of life on this planet. You need large imaginative projects if you're going to generate the public will to move dollars into an enterprise. Biodiversity science needs that support. It's a critical time in our planet's history. And 20% of the money will go to sequencing. The other 80% is going to go to the traditional domains of collection, curation, and uh, systematic and taxonomic support. Barcodes. What do we get if we deliver a, develop a reference library for known species? We're going to create a master key to life that's based on 250 years of taxonomic work. I mean, this isn't isolating from past work. It's codifying it in a simple fashion so it can be accessed by kids. Uh, there was a, a new scientist ran a picture of a bright red and black insect on, on trees here in Urbana, Illinois. Someone in this room can undoubtedly identify it. No one has answered the question, what is this beast, five weeks later? Um, it'll make it possible to identify all life stages. This is a terrific impediment to all sorts of work. It will help to resolve synonymy that's slowing up the advance of so much taxonomic work. The identifications are going to be cheap and fast. Don't look at it as current technology, which covers a desktop. Look at it occurring in minutes and look at it in, for pennies in your hand. And uh, there's no doubt that this is going to be here. The residual taxonomy, uh, taxonomic certain, uncertainty is going to be low. It's going to be 1% to 2% of cases. Uh, are traditional keys any better if executed broadly? Even if they are, this is going to be very accessible. Can we use barcodes to recognize new species? Of course we can. We're using it today. Uh, DNA barcodes uh, show a strong correspondence. The units recognized that show deep divergence for the barcode regions are exactly those, in most cases, have been recognized by conventional taxonomic study, whether we're dealing with columbolins or cetaceans. Um, there's nothing new in this observation. It's, it's been reinforced time and time again. Most new species in well-studied taxonomic groups are recognized because of mitochondrial DNA divergence. Mitochondria is co-1, effectively, because it's a single unit. So barcodes, uh, using a sequence threshold is not going to be perfect. It's going to recognize about 95% of species. It's not going to recognize the youngest species in the assemblage. However, it will recognize species that have been overlooked by prior study, as in the, the bird uh, cases I showed you. The barcode species counts are going to be almost identical, even in, in visually uh, character-rich groups like birds and, and insects, to the counts that you'd get through conventional taxonomy. That's if we knew nothing. Um, the, the important role for barcodes, though, is in species discovery of those groups which aren't charismatic, the nematodes, the mites, uh, vast numbers of organisms which simply don't attract huge populations of taxonomists. Uh, barcodes will allow us to create rough uh, and rapid taxonomic draft systems that can be honed through later taxonomic study. Total evidence is the goal of the barcode initiative. 
We can't see it being anywhere but. We're going to be taking photographs, imaging all these things. The specimens must be deposited in museums or they're not barcode compliant. As you think about your vote, and I realize there are a few of you who aren't convinced that this is the way to go, uh, Dan Jansen says the pioneering effort in DNA barcoding will set in motion the single most significant project in biology that I know of today. Wheeler, Raven, and Wilson, fashionable DNA barcoding are a breakthrough for identification. Robert May, uh, head of the Royal Society, I believe that problems of species numbers will be solved by taking a small piece of organisms, sticking them in a handheld machine which analyzes their DNA. Moritz and Chichero, there's little doubt that large-scale standardized sequencing can contribute significantly to the challenge of identifying individuals and increasing the rate of discovering biological diversity. So as you think about whether or not you personally want to support this initiative, I think you might want to think about some of those individuals that have voted their careers to the study of biological diversity and see this as an appealing way to deal with the diversity of life and to create the momentum that we're going to need to finish an inventory of life on this planet within certainly all your lifespans and hopefully within uh, mine, at least animal life. So I hope you'll vote for the propositions. I think now's a grand time to make contributions to species coverage and methodological innovation. If you're interested in learning more, come to London next February when there's a barcode conference. Thank you. I don't have any slides for the end. I don't think you need any more visuals. Just think about it, and it'll be clear to you. The propositions themselves are actually just a couple of questions that allow you to sort of generate some thought, like the demonstration we had with the barcoding and identifying specimens here. It's just a situation that causes you to, to think about the situation more carefully. DNA barcoding is, is not an alternative to systematics and taxonomy. I know they continue to say that that's not what they're trying to do. In the end, huge projects with that much money have an enormous gravitational pull. And they will pull people out of our field and away from the work that they should be doing to work on projects that look glorious, but the end product is deficient. We need to stick fast with producing monographs and works that we know are going to leave a lasting mark on biology. And I think that the last person who spoke up there actually was very accurate in saying that we probably can go out there and with the kind of money that we need, train the right biologists and enough biologists and systematists to do the work for 80 or 90 percent of life. And in doing so, we create more than just an identification tool. We create thinking biologists, people who in their studies of their organisms understand the general principles of bio biology and can come up with new and better theories in biology. We create the kind of situation where they're going to propagate their interest and their knowledge to students, and so we continue to have generations of biologists who are interested in the natural world. On the other side, if we have a huge monolithic project that we give into, then we're going to have a loss of that. We're going to lose not only the legacy data, but our future. It doesn't mean that everything that the DNA barcoding proponents are proposing is bad. Certainly, vouchering DNA and having databases of DNA and those things will make specimens more available to you to do your research. So what I would say is that there is an appropriate place and a measure for it. It's not an appropriate stopgap against the current, what has been referred to as the tax taxonomic impediment. Reliance on DNA barcodes will eventually lead to DNA taxonomy. I see no other course. We've only named about one and a half million of the 10 or 20 million species that are out there. Reliance that, well, so it leads us to DNA taxonomy, and there won't be a body of taxonomists around to correct the problems. In the end, expedience, expediency today will lead to reflexive belief in the future. DNA barcoding shouldn't be something that you place as a prominent part of your research because it's not scientific and it shouldn't be primary in species discovery because it's both typological and it's deficient in the end. Use all the tools that are available to you, including mitochondrial sequences and other sequences, but use them in the right measure and use them for the right purpose. Thank you.
Okay, so now, the moment of truth. I know we're all anxious to go for lunch. So, let's go straight to it. Back to those propositions again. You've heard the argument. What do you think now? Should we devote resources towards producing a reference collection of specimens for the development of a DNA barcoding system? All those in favour? Okay. All those against? And once more, abstentions. Still unconvinced. Okay, and this second proposition. <laughs> Should DNA sequences play a primary role in the discovery of new species? All those in favour? And those against? I'll give them a bit longer. <laughs> yep. Okay, thanks. And abstentions. Okay. Well, while our counters are tossing those up, I just want to leave you with a few very brief closing remarks because I know we're all really keen to go to lunch. This is from a really interesting document written by a guy <coughs> called Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly is... Um, He's uh, actually perhaps more known to some of you maybe as the founding editor of Wired magazine. But maybe more relevant to us, he's actually on the governing, uh, he's one of the chairmen of the All Species Foundation. And he wrote a really interesting document entitled Lessons for the All Species Project from the Human Genome Project. And I encourage you all to read this. Maybe we can put a link on the conference website to this document. But I just want to make a few, uh, read a few quotes from this whilst our counters are counting their points up. So first off, the Human Genome Project featured a goal that probably would have happened anyway over time. It took ordinary work and raised it to the level of legend and myth by attempting to complete it all in a relatively short time. The Genome Project is then primarily distinguished by its emphasis on all. A recurring theme in the mission statement of the All Species Inventory is the need for radically different and new tools. All species must be open to the possibility of succeeding using existing tools applied in new ways, or simply old tools automated to lightning speed. However, because the current taxonomic procedures are so low-tech, almost any improvement might resemble radical technology. All species has an even better chance to become a project the public cares about. Far more people can identify a known species and they can identify a known DNA sequence. This is a project that can relate to everyone. All species for all people. And finally, someday all the species living on Earth will be identified, although surely not all the ones alive today. Why not now? I'm not going to pass any comment on these, I'm just going to leave them hanging. And do we have our final figures. Okay. And this is always the same. Right. So proposition one, I think we maybe need to go back to them. Uh, proposition one, should we devote resources towards sequencing a reference collection of specimens? The first number, the, f the, first, the number of people who voted yes in round one was 39, no, 38. Uh, sorry, uh, yes in round two, uh, the second vote, 39. So a slight increase. Uh, no in the first round, 49. No in the second round, 30. Abstentions originally were 17, and they're now 41. <laughs> Proposition two. Should DNA sequences play a primary role in the discovery of new species? Originally, we had 22, now 26. 
No, originally 72, now 59. Abstentions, originally 9, now 27. <laughs> <laughs> That's for you to decide. Okay. Very quickly, a few people to thank. It's taken a lot of effort to get some of this to go together. Thanks, firstly, to Paul and Kip for being very sporting in coming along. They didn't know the questions in advance. It was completely a bit of a mystery as to what was going to happen for them, so thanks very much. Our students, Martin, Daniela, Tate, uh, Floyd, and Jamie. The specimen providers, Kevin Cummings, Martin Hauser, Andy Miller, Mark Wetzel, and Kazunori Yoshizawa. Particularly, particular thanks to Mike and Gail for uh, my constant, uh, dealing with my constant questions that I had putting this thing together. And last, but by no means least, NSF for funding this event. Thank you very much.